I have been so excited about this episode because just a few months ago, I'm sitting on the couch, I'm watching the Winter Olympics, and I jump up and down like a lunatic because Lindsay Jacob Ellis just won the gold medal, one of the oldest women in winter sports to ever win a gold medal, one of the oldest athletes to ever win gold, and she just showed up all of the young guys and gals out there. You're going to be blown away by Lindsay Jacob Ellis on this episode of Unbeatable. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable. Lindsay, thank you so much for taking some time out of a crazy busy schedule to be on this episode of Unbeatable with me. I'm really excited to be here and I'm so happy that we could make this work. Yeah, thanks. Um, I got to tell you, just a few months ago, I'm sitting on my couch in the warm um, living room and at the end of your event, I jump up off the couch and go berserk. And of course, everybody in my family is looking at me like I'm crazy because of what you and your partner accomplished in the Olympics. Um, just a few months ago in China, let's talk about the snowboard cross in uh, with you and Baumgartner in just a few minutes. Um, but um, did you get your start on the snow? Because it sounds like you grew up in the Northeast and around the slopes, maybe on skis first before you transitioned onto snowboard. But did you did you just basically start? Uh, you go straight from crawling to to skiing and snowboarding as an as an infant. Actually, no. And my parents did not push me into really any sport. I was involved in so many different sports growing up. Every season, it was always a different sport. I think it was just their way to get a little break between having two kids. So it was just (laughs) easier to drop them off to do a sport, run, let their energy levels Uh just completely deplete themselves and then be able to take us back home and tolerate us at home. So, you know, every season it was something different. But in the winter, my dad really enjoyed skiing with his two best friends and they were all starting to have kids. So it was that next generation of exposing us to skiing in that environment. And I think my dad took me on the slopes when I was five and I had probably a huge fit because I got snow in my glove <laughs> and he was like, yeah. I'll try this next year. It's right. a little too soon. So I was hanging out in the lodge probably with my mother a little bit more at that age. But then You know, I remember those early moments uh, skiing, learning to, you know, link my turns. But I I vividly remember always being like between my dad's legs and and me ski. And my dad would just haul down the mountain. So kind of just, I could just go autopilot. And uh, it was just this uh, moment that my dad was like, Anita, my, my niece can't really do this anymore. She wants to keep going for runs. Can you take her up on the bunny slope and, and take her for a few more runs? And my mom took me up and she's just like, we yeah. like go slower. And, take and you're your saying time. faster, faster, and right? And I told her, I was like, mom, you go too slow. I'm, I'll do it myself. <laughs> So and that's when I started skiing yeah, by myself. Yeah, and I got this mental image right now of you <laughs> between your dad's legs just flying down the the snow as fast as you can go as a little girl and with the biggest smile in the world on your face. Yeah, it was always funny had the the ski poles like right across my chest so I could hold on to them and I could just be, you know, feeling like I was just flying and you know, my dad's always talking to me the whole time and where are we looking, where are we going, yeah. what's weight are you what ski do you have the weight on right now and so it was just always this interactive uh communication between us the whole time down and i could definitely see how that could be extremely sure. wearing so yeah. it, it was cool to see that but then ultimately i realized <laughs> that uh i was just kind of working that a little bit longer just because i wanted to go fast and yeah. have it just be easy and fun but then eventually took that leap myself and just uh, just did it. And we probably didn't get into snowboarding until my brother decided to rent a snowboard and no lesson or anything and just went to the top of the mountain at All Stratton, right. Vermont. And 
he figured it out. We were like, you know, we don't want to wait for you. What are you doing? Like go to right. the bunny hill or like, well, why are you so into this? And he just was like, this is so cool. I've been seeing these movies and these shows and snowboarding starting to become this popular thing. And we weren't sold on it right away. Uh -huh. But then as soon as I saw my brother link his turns and see how much fun he was having being a younger sibling, it's like you follow suit and right. you want to doing what your older siblings doing. So he was the pioneer for my family. So after bugging my dad, like, I want to try snowboarding. I want to try snowboarding. My dad's like, oh, like he wants to do things uh -huh. with us. Yeah. Like I'm not going to ski and you snowboard. So I might as well learn to snowboard with you. So my father and I took lessons together. Oh, that's cool. And you know, my dad picked it up right away. Did and he I really? Actually, yeah. I yeah. actually struggled with it and my brother had to take me to the bunny slope and work on it because I was always so nervous of trying to do uh you know linking my turns because I had to go so slow yeah. to do it so I would just haul down the mountain doing the falling leap on like one uh -huh. edge because I didn't want to get left behind and now my mom's like well now you're all snowboarding yeah, I just great. figured out right and so she learned to snowboard uh so our whole family transitioned and switched and we'd still dabble and do both. But eventually um, through a series of uh, crazy events, our house uh, in Vermont that we were sharing with for a couple of families uh -huh. burned down and we lost all of our equipment and you know how insurance companies oh, yeah. take forever right. and we just couldn't afford to get skis and snowboards. And we were just waiting for that money to come through and all, all we could do was afford one. And my dad asked, like, do you want skis or snowboards? Cause yeah. right now we can time, only afford time one. to choose. And, right. And yeah, my brother and I picked snowboarding. So it's kind of a, a crazy turn of events that led me to this, this track in yeah. my life that opened up so many opportunities and, it's it's not a blueprint that someone right. could follow. Yeah. It was not intended. It was not planned. It was just how it came to be, and that's that's the the wild thing about it. Yeah, who who would think that a house fire would lead to you becoming one of the most successful athletes of any gender, let alone female athletes on a snowboard? Um, you know, in history, how old were you when you made that transition from skis to snowboard? I want to say I was 11 or 12. Uh -huh. I, 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 I think, I think 98 or 99 was when our house burned down. It was like, it was yeah. just the new year. So uh -huh. I can't remember exactly which year it actually was, but nobody was actually staying in the house, which was really good because my brother and my yeah. dad were thinking of staying an extra night. Uh -huh. So no one was there. It was a super upsetting thing. We lost so many oh, memories that yeah. could not be replaced. And, you know, a lot of history on, on Stratton Mountain as well. Old signs yeah. that had been, yeah. you know, found through hikes and, and old antique skis and uh, just so many things that made it such this like time warp yeah. and experience to like go to this old 70s ski house mm -hmm. that we would ransack every weekend with my family and two other family friends. So it was, it was definitely, a, yeah, I a bet that was devastating. Yeah. Um, for people that are not familiar, you eventually start to make your way to the X games are extremely successful. In fact, um, if I did my research correctly, you've got 10 gold in X games and, uh, several other X games medals. Um, is that accurate? Yes, I believe I have 10 golds in border cross, a silver, and I have a bronze in slope style. Yeah. So I used to do all three events. And then once ESPN went to live uh -huh. formatting, it just became so challenging to do all three right. events. So there was one day that I would be qualifying for border cross, then have to go over and train for half pipe, then qualify for half pipe later in the evening. But in between, like go check out the slope style course. And, you know, it, it was, it was a lot. And yeah. then over time, 
that started to just wear on my body right. physically to have to go from one to the next and do so many in a day that I started to get injured more. Yeah. And I'd have to, you know, drop out of the event. Um, so the first one I dropped was slope style. Um, Cause I remember we were at the top of the half pipe. Uh -huh. I just qualified or maybe even raced for border cross. And then la the next night was, you know, half pipe finals uh -huh. and there was an NBA game on that was going into overtime. So we were just Great, sitting right? at the top of the pipe. Right. Outside freezing, freezing your freezing your rear end off. I was like, can't you guys just record this and we just pretend it's live. Right. We have to sit here forever in overtime. So we're all trying to keep warm and it's just, it's snowing and uh -huh. it's dark out. And we're like trying to keep our like energy up because at any moment they could be like, okay, we're live, ready to go. So it it is challenging to do those. And then I think the next day was slope style. And I think after that, I was like, I think I have to drop slope yeah. style. You know, it was my my least best event. And then a few years later, probably, I want to say after maybe 2007 or 8, I decided to drop half pipe, half pipe. as well because yeah. it was just, it was just starting to get harder, harder and harder to keep up with the level because that kept just escalating oh, yeah. every yeah. year. And you're trying to throw yourself to do something even crazier. And then you have the younger girls that are coming up. They're like, we're not afraid. And we're made of rubber. We're, <laughs> right. you know, we're just going to huck ourselves. And I was like, Oh, I have to be more calculated. Yeah. And I, yeah. can't, I can't risk that. Um, so it just, it just ended up being um, uh, something that I eventually st stood back from and then put all of my focus into taking care of my body to perform my best for snowboard cross. Yeah. So uh, I was about to ask you about Snowboard Cross. When the documentary came out about Snowboard Cross, it referred to this event as high risk and low reward. Um, what is it that made you just fall in love with this one and decide, you know what, if I can only give it, uh, if I can only compete really well at one, it's going to be Snowboard Cross. It's interesting Again, it's just another thing that I happened to fall into. And it was the first, Snowboard Cross was the first snowboarding event I had actually participated in. It was at Stratton. It was the Friday Night really? Border Cross. Huh. Yeah, and, and it was before I was even competing at USASA Nationals that helps give you national recognition to then go compete for nationals. All of that, it was just this fun race that, Stratton put on every Friday night on the bunny slope. They just kind really? of whipped together. All right. Little course. It was maybe 30 seconds long. You know, there was no official start gate. It was like a bungee start. They just hold a bungee, just let it go across. There's nothing <laughs> formal. I was just put in the 12 and unders, just guys and girls, uh -huh. just 12 and unders. And uh, it was just this exciting thing that my brother and I could race and be racing for prizes. We're getting free gloves or goggles or yeah, coolers. Free that point, gear. Like, that's, that's the most exciting thing to get. And then they'd have like raffles afterwards. And sometimes professional snowboarders would show up to this event. So it would always be like, who could show up? Like who could we see that's in this industry and that we're tapping into their little world. And you know, my brother and I loved the movie Rad growing yeah. up, uh -huh. BMX movie. So uh -huh. in the summertime, like I turned my first bike that, you know, had the training wheels yeah, on it right. into my BMX bike because I got big. And so the bike was just relatively smaller. So I lower the seat nice. and still have like the little tick, yep. tick, tick, tick around the wheels and the streamers. But my brother and I would make jumps for our bikes and pretend that we would be racing. We'd make these little bank turns and sculpt them out of dirt and build them up with just water and make these just nice, like muddy bank turns in our woods. So I think we really liked the concept of that racing because it really was so similar to that movie and how, how much we liked that racing and that, that whole style yeah. and excitement. Um, so it, it, again, it's not something that we planned. It just had this like symmetry within our life mm -hmm. and our time together as siblings and, and what we were trying to, 
you know, get accomplished. I just had this mental image of you as a little girl with curly hair and the, you know, the pink bicycle with the streamers doing a double back backflip off of that thing, you know, trying to figure out, uh, you know, some BMX as soon as they take the training wheels off. <laughs> Um, for people, we, we definitely didn't do any backwards, yeah. but <laughs> so for the listeners that have no concept about snowboard cross, didn't watch you in the Olympic games. Can you give them like a 30 second description of what this feels like to be the athlete that's competing, um, and try to explain this event to them because there's lots of people that just have never heard this phrase before. Okay, so border cross is very similar to motocross or supercross event. So similar features. You have bank turns, you have whoops or rollers, mm -hmm. is what we call them in our industry. Um, we have jumps, and then there's always like the weird funky features that builders always try to put their, you know, stamp on a course to make it unique to them. And every course is different because um, we have, you know, different pitches on different courses wherever they decide to build a course and every mountain is different. And every snow year is different right. depending on the amount of snow you get. So one year you could essentially have the course built in the same area, but the course could vary a little bit uh -huh. just because if we dig here and try to build up something, you could hit dirt. So it's it's cool to be able to have that variety and it made it so you re never really knew exactly what to expect and in the early years you know the sean palmer years yeah. like you could see the craziest courses and there could be gap jumps you could be jumping over water you could be having two awesome. different options and and you know they they always kept it really fun so the concept of this very similar to supercross and all that you have the start gate and four to six riders depending mm -hmm. on the um who's hosting and who's sponsoring sometime in the early years we all started with six riders and now it's really developed to four um it's just a little bit more cost efficient to build a course for four riders instead of six. It's a little safer as yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah. Add, yeah. Add two more people. That's, and now you know, it gets gnarly in those turns, right? More percentages. So we don't have nearly as many racers in a heat as Supercross uh -huh. would. But that same start gate mentality that you have like the 30 seconds and then all of a sudden it could just drop at any time and you need to go. So if there's six people in a heat, the top three will advance mm -hmm. to the next round. And if there's four people in the heat, the top two advance to the next round. You have your brackets, you know, starting you with um, your top 16, if it's four or 32, if it's um, six, and you get down to your final four. As you're eliminating people, you have more people that are mm -hmm. moving through the brackets. So you're racing, you know, at least four high intensity heats that could range from a minute to two minutes and you know a lot of lactic acid builds up you're, you're breathing in the cold so your chest can burn um you're dealing with all sorts of elements not only just the you know the other athletes that you have no control over what's going on right. with their planning but you also have you know wind is it snowing? What kind of snow is under you? So there's so many other factors that can come into play. So it's really anyone's game and anyone, anything could happen in border cross. That's what makes it a spectacular spectator sport, but it also makes it so, you know, if you didn't have the best start, like anything could happen. Yeah. You could be drafting really well, or someone could be crashing and you're trying right. to avoid it. It's like, it could be full days of thunder out there. And you're like, all of a sudden going through a cloud of smoke and you're like, God, I really hope I don't hit yeah. somebody because I can't see anything. Right. I have no clue where anyone is. So we've, we've had some wild experiences in our time, wild crashes and, but it's always been a really exciting thing to be a part of and to be a part of the growth of the sport yeah. has been very special. Yeah. And I'm definitely really one of those earlier racers that is still racing yeah. today. And that's what was really cool about racing with Baumgartner because of the history that we've had in the right. sport. We came into the U S team a year or so after 
Um, I did. So we really have this, you know, uh, years and years, yeah. decades of experience, right. as well as, um, you know, just being just seasoned athletes. It Sometimes that can work against you, but it definitely worked with us for yeah. Beijing. I am a huge Olympics fan. I'm just, everything about the Olympics fascinates me. So I'm in Afghanistan on the side of a mountain years ago, uh, holding on to an antenna, trying to tune in the winter games so that I can watch curling because I will take any event from any Olympic games. I'm just that fascinated with it. But when it comes to the winter Olympics, by far the most exciting event is border cross no question because your race in the mountain and you've got the elements and you've got the clock and you've got all of the other um, athletes that are on the course with you at the same time like you've got it all and you have to have it uh, you have to compete against all of it all at once and um, you know it's just electric to watch you go down the course um, during the olympics Um, that event is in my mind it stands out above all of the others in the winter olympics I appreciate that. It's 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 very hard for my family to watch because because they have so much invested. Yeah, sure. It's probably very stressful. So it's great to hear that other people are enjoying it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and of course, when you got that much action and excitement and that much danger, you're going to have some wipeouts along the way. Um, oh, let's yeah. talk about. 2012 when you blew out your ACL uh explain what was going on what happened but more than anything let's talk about the road to recovery after that oh that was a hard one so this was January end of January 2012 I am preparing for x games uh it's a a long course it's like a two and a half minute course it's a leg burner your legs are shaking at Mm -hmm. the bottom because if you're not actually on you know, an element trying to generate speed, you're in a tuck. So yeah. you're just in a squat for two minutes straight, trying to go down this mountain as fast as you can. I was training with the guys on my team and, you know, if I don't pull out right ahead of them, then it's very hard for me to stay in their draft. So that was usually a tactic when we're training. If I pull out just mm-hmm. ahead, they're going to have a stronger pull. They'll eventually get right ahead of me, but then I could pull into their draft. This is a training exercise that just helped me build confidence because if I'm going the speed that they're going, I have no problem hitting some of the gap jumps. I can calculate my speed. Um, And this is me, you know, after radio communication with my coach and watching certain things, talking with other athletes to make sure things link together. Because the last thing you want to do is come up short. In that regard, we are not the same right. as Supercross. We don't have the suspension. Yeah. So that suspension is taken out of our bodies. Right. And that's not always the best uh, combo. So I was riding hard with these guys. And we're coming down to the last stretch where it's this big rollover. And then it's just this really, really big jump at the end. And they actually made a woman's jump because the guy's jump was like over 100 feet. Wow. And um, they they just didn't feel the women carried the weight yeah. to actually get the speed to right. hit it. And they made it so like the girls hit one side and the guys hit one side. And that wasn't uncommon because mm-hmm. X games wants to have the big show. They want the options. Usually if you could hit the bigger jump, it would maybe cut off some time, but they just made the rule at that time. Like we don't want people crossing because they right. kind of, they kind of, the, the trajectories crossed a little bit. And since the guys were already way ahead, it wasn't going to be an issue. So After following them, I'm coming down the last stretch. I'm right behind them. You know, I'm in the tuck in the tuck, like right behind them. Then I'm like, okay, I need to slow down. So I open up. I'm catching, you know, wind. I can feel myself slowing down, turn off to the side, do a turn or so, and hit the jump. And then all of a sudden, I'm still just gone. And I remember my coach filming me and him like, I'm jumping out of the distance. And he goes, Oh no, <laughs> like, that's so not just, good. And so 
you know, I had overshot the landing. So I'm not landing on the nice yeah. slope on yeah. the back. I'm not coming up short, but I'm not landing with nice, you know, a nice angle to help absorb you know, the impact, minimize right? the impact. So I'm landing past and it's flat and I stomp the landing and ride out of it. But I heard this pop and you know, you have so much adrenaline because it was the first time yeah. I was hitting the big jump and it's really hard to actually remember and feel your senses when something so intense happens. And, you know, I was like, ah, that, that didn't feel good. My knee doesn't feel good. And I unstrap and I didn't want to be the girl that uh -huh. like gets hurt and holds up practice. So I unstrapped and got off to the side and, you know, you kind of just had like, I had the, like the shakes all over, yeah. like just had this adrenaline surge. And I was like, that's, that's not normal. I, I don't really know what's happening. And, and I tried to stand up and my leg just gave out and it, you know, I was just super nervous and scared. And you start to just like, you're going, you're like, what, what hurts? Like yeah. you're doing yeah. checklist right. because you just so much adrenaline. You can't actually pinpoint where the problem is. And all the medical staffs coming over, they're like, oh, what's this? And I'm like, I think my knee, they're like, let's go get you an x-ray. I'm like, I'm not moving from this spot. Tell one of our <laughs> physical therapists right. or doctors, I am right here. An x-ray is not going to do anything. I I want someone to assess yeah. me here because you don't want to be taken out of training. You don't want to be, you know, you know, I just, I didn't want to also just right. go off with somebody that I didn't know and then not communicate like, you know, to our coaches or anyone like, how come Lindsay didn't come back around? Like what happened to her? And then they're trying to track me down. So I get down and they're assessing me and like, it's pretty obvious that I blew my ACL and I'm trying to, you know, walk it off and be uh -huh. like, I'll be better. Like I'll be able to compete. And then it's just like, no, mm -hmm. like it, it's not there. It's, it's uh, very swollen already. And you know, after an MRI, which I had done right at Aspen, um, you know, hours later, you know, there was significant damage to the posterior horn of my meniscus where it attaches yeah. to the bone. So, you know, we knew right then and there, you know, the rest of my season was a wash and, you know, what we did the best we could was just try to get as much swelling out and get me scheduled for surgery and immediately start, you know, you wake up and when you're an Olympic caliber athlete, you wake up out of surgery and your machine, your leg is in this machine. That's all yeah, already, it's already moving it, right? Moving you. Cause they're all, they're like, Nope, we got to get movement in this joint. We can't have it static. We got, and then as soon as, you know, you're kind of conscious and not loopy on your painkillers. You're sitting on the bench. They're like, lift your leg. You're like, lift my leg. That's the, that's the most ridiculous thing ever. And then you're like, I can't lift my leg. Yeah. Like my muscles aren't working. And they're like, they're, they're po like poking your leg. You're like, fire this muscle. You're like, I don't know what muscle that is. Right. <laughs> they're trying to get your VMO, like um, your medial, yeah. like quad be firing and, and activating because it's shut down so much when they're swelling around a joint, like your body's like, no, there's mm -hmm. something wrong. Like, we're not doing anything to this muscle. There's, there's trauma in this area, but they're trying to reprogram your brain to just push through that. So it really helps speed along that process. And it's been pretty incredible to see the advances that have been made, even just in the last few years yeah. of what they do with recoveries and ACL, like compared to what I had to deal with 10 years ago. Um, but it took over, well, unfortunately I was like eight or like nine months post-op and I was starting to get back into intense workouts and plyometrics. And I was just like, God, my knee just doesn't feel yeah, great. And yeah. everyone just kept saying like, that's normal. It's not going to feel the same. Like, and I'm like, is it supposed to feel sloppy? Like, well, like what, like, can, can someone just can we take another picture of it? And you tell me it's solid and it's fine. And I just have to learn to deal with that. And they're like, yeah, okay. If that, if that makes you feel better about mm -hmm. yourself. And we looked at the MRI and you did not have to be a doctor to see how my ACL in my knee was just a little bit longer and like squigglier. It wasn't squiggly. ruptured again. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it just didn't have the tension. And, you know, I had used, my hamstring as the new graft, mm -hmm. you know, um, my doctor figured, you know, he's had so much success with that and he's had so many other athletes, 
um, with similar, you know, body types and, and sport requirements that he was like, I'm very confident and this is what I've been doing lately. And this is what I want to proceed with. And it's like, of course, he's our U S team doctor. Right. Like you're going to agree with that. And for some reason, my own tissue did not become Didn't like it, viable. right? And it just, it, and whether I was just too hypermobile within my muscle tissue that it just didn't end up being the best fit to become, you know, a muscle or like tendon right. fibrous tissue to begin become a ligament, you know, who knows or understands the science behind that. It just didn't work. So, you know, my doctor's like, well, the ACL is there. It is just not as tight as we would have hoped. Right. You know, I was doing checkups and he was doing that, the Lachman's test and, you know, so it had maybe slowly stretched over time because through all my checkups, everything was great. So my doctor is literally almost in tears and beside himself to be like, I don't understand what happened. And he's like, you can definitely perform on this knee, but you know, there's nothing structurally wrong yeah. with it. It's just a little looser. And I'm like, this is an 80% knee. I, I need a hundred percent. That's right. What I'm competing at, at this level, like I, I, I need the best. And he's like, okay, I can schedule for surgery tomorrow. Stop eating now. And I'm like, okay, that's what we did. So, um, I believe it was December that same year. I started that process all over wow. again, but it wasn't as long because I didn't have to wait for meniscus to heal. I just had to then let the ACL revascularize. Uh -huh. And that was before blood flow restriction was implemented. So I still had to wait those six months for wow. revascularization yeah. to happen. You start feeling really good at three months. And that's when all the doctors are like, you're not fine. Yeah. You Don't go great. out there and go 100%. You are not fine. Yeah. Do not run. Do not step on uneven surfaces. You are not fine. You're feeling great. We love that you're feeling great, but you are on a stationary bike and you are in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. and that's it. And you're like, oh, yeah, well, I definitely don't want to be dealing with that again. But I just, I did a cadaver. And since I didn't have to do the meniscus healing, that process just went faster. Yeah. I, it was just a lot harder to regain all the muscle mass because I wasn't as strong as before the right. first surgery. And I'd only maybe gotten part of my strength back before the, the next surgery had to happen. Yeah. So it was just a very, very long time until I got back. And Baumgartner actually was the first person that I took some runs with officially when uh -huh. I, when I cleared my strength test to return to snow. Um, it was in June of 2013 and uh, it was at hood. Our team camp usually hap happens around that time, but I really just wanted to go there for a couple of days mm -hmm. and take a few runs. And he was up there visiting family and he was literally like the dad on the slopes, like going right behind me. And I'm <laughs> All right. going so slow and he's like running near interference yeah. and nobody's going to hit me. And he's filming me like, Woo, and I'm like, I know how to turn. Okay. It's just, <laughs> I haven't done it in a yeah. while. So it was, it, it's kind of crazy how long we've been yeah. in each other's lives in, in that aspect. Um, so it was a very pivotal moment right there. And then, you know, that winter, that's the year you start qualifying yeah, for the right. 2014 Olympics. So it, it, uh, it definitely was a, a very hard thing. That was probably the most challenging injury for myself to ever come back from just trying to build strength wise. So, uh, I'm glad that those advances have right. now come through in such long ways and that you're able to build muscle mass a lot faster. But in, in my cycle and that technology that was available then still, uh, um, was not there. Uh, During that whole road to recovery, did you get to the point a couple of times where you thought that's it, my career is over with, like, I'm never going to be able to get to the speeds and the, the strength that I once had. 100% that goes, goes through your mind all the time. And I had, you know, physical therapists, I had doctors, I had coaches, friends, family, everyone saying, you will get there, you'll get your strength, you will remember how it is. And you just wonder, like, will I be able to fall and have this hold up? Right? Will yeah. I be as fearless as I, you know, once was like, all of these things go through your mind. And you 
you have to almost get that first crash out of the way and you fall and you're like, no, I'm okay. Like, yeah. and you're like, my, knee, my knee's okay. And it, it took, it took a while. I, I raced with a, a, a knee brace for a year uh-huh. and then our doctors want us to wean off of that because they don't want us so dependent on that. But it is just that, you know, hypermobility that I was dealing with, with my extension. They didn't want it to yeah. go into extension, but they also don't want it to go like past 90 degrees flexion because that's when your ACL right. is most yeah. risk for tearing. So during those, you know, years where you might not have that same strength or neurological reaction time to help protect right when you need mm-hmm. to, our doctors liked having those braces and then having to wean off the brace right. is a whole nother mental emotional thing. So you're like, I'll I'll just take a few runs and I'll free ride without the brace. But then you're like, I'll still race with the brace. And they're like, no, the brace is gone. Right. <laughs> So basically what you're telling me is Nick Baumgartner was when you were Ricky Bobby, Nick, Nick Baumgartner is the one that put the cougar in the car with you and made you figure out how to drive fast again. Yes, yeah. exactly. It, it was, uh, yeah, it was definitely a very memorable experience and to have somebody there cheering as if you are a toddler accomplishing yeah. something great, you needed, you needed those moments. You right. needed those wins. Yeah. to help keep progressing mentally and physically along because the mental component is the biggest component. Like our, our doctors, our, our strength coaches, you know, told me you pass the test, right. you are physically strong enough to handle you falling from the sky from a jump this big, you know, we, you, we have to have the calculations and science to support your strength. So mentally, now you need to believe in yourself. Yeah. And you're like, Oh God, mentally. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. This is a great time to let's just have a little bit of fun with each other. I do this part of the a segment in my episodes called a high five, where we just ha- have fun with a subject. You've gone down, you've had some bumps and bruises. I've gone down before. And I want to just spend a little bit of time um, talking about some of your best wipeouts or some of my best wipeouts. Um, being a guy who spent, uh, more than 20 years in the army and jumping out of airplanes, what you just described is it's rampant in the army. When somebody jumps out of an airplane, if things don't go according to plan and either the parachute doesn't open or they get banged up a little bit, getting them physically healthy enough to jump out of an airplane is pretty quick and pretty easy. Getting them mentally ready to jump out of an airplane can be devastating. In fact, some people, it just takes, uh, it just takes it out of them and they'll never jump again. So we had this standard practice. If you jumped out of an airplane and your parachute didn't open the way that it was supposed to, you had to pull your reserve. There was a problem, but you made it to the ground safely. We would tell people immediately put him on another airplane, get him up there and push him out again. Even if he doesn't want to go out the door, push him out again, because if you don't, he'll sit at home tonight, he'll think about it and he'll never, ever jump again. Yeah, um, and that makes sense. It's getting right back on the horse after. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I mean, jumping out of an airplane is completely different from what I do. And my cousin actually does that in the army as well. Nice. So Tell your cousin, mad respect for him. It. He absolutely loves it. And he loves that thrill. We obviously are cut from similar right. cloth. <laughs> we have a little bit of that crazy in us. But yeah, I could imagine that would be extremely hard something that's so rattling you know i have a high probability of getting injured it's not right. a lot of life scenario so that that's a whole different level to come back from mentally so yeah but tell everybody one or two of your best wipeouts so you described the one that cost you your acl and it was a pop while you were on the course but if you can hear something pop with that kind of speed and adrenaline, it's not good to be able to hear a pop. Let's talk about one no. or two other good wipeouts. I, I would say, I'm trying to remember what year it was, but it was in Sun Valley, Idaho. It was the Jeep King of the Mountain series. And I was the first heat of the ladies to go um, because of my seating and everything. And there was just this whole horrible weather coming in you could not see the first Uh you barely see your hand if you're putting it in front and they're supposed to put the blue dye 
on the right. course to help with giving you some depth perception right. and just things coming and you know the course. So um, it's just it's just called flat light and it's really hard to get any sort of depth perception of awareness of where you are in body space and yeah. time. And I'm literally standing in the gate and you just see the cloud coming up the hill. And I'm like, <laughs> we're, we're not doing anything about this. Like yeah. it's, and oh. they're like, Oh, we're, we're dealing with a court uh, TV hold right now. We're, we're having problems with a cable or something. Oh, I'm like, well, yeah. while we're doing that. Can we get more color on the course? We can't see. And I mean, this happens throughout my career all the time, uh -huh. which is why I start freaking out and yelling at people because I feel I've earned the right to be a pain in the butt right. to start telling people like, I understand that you have sponsors and people responsible for actually making this whole thing go. But if you want to see the best out of us and for it to not be a joke, give us, yeah. you know, the best vision we could possibly do or possibly have and stop worrying about the TV. Right. Feed. And that, that happens so much more than not. You wouldn't be surprised. And they're like, Nope, sorry, we can't. And we're going to go. And me being a younger wow. athlete and standing up for myself as much back then as I do now, you know, I could have boycotted. I had, a, I mm -hmm. still had a great name at that time. They're like, I'm strapped. They're like, I'm not racing. I can't see like, this is ridiculous. And I could just sit there and just do the queen wave and be like, why didn't you go? It's All like, right. They, they send us down the course. You can't see that wasn't the case. I go and I was riding that course really well because there was a lot of big doubles that girls uh -huh. were not comfortable doing it. So you commit to just full bore yeah. high speed and you pick that one speed. There wasn't really a, a middle speed. So if you were not hitting those doubles, you had to do a lot of speed checking to slow yourself down so you could actually uh -huh. roll those rolls and it to be safe. So I'm coming through like the middle part of the course and I just did those big double sections and I'm just like, I don't hear anyone behind me. I must be way ahead. I need to slow down. So they had built the way they've designed this course that you did all these big jumps and doubles up and then it swooped around and then it had this, this another pitch and I come over the pitch and it's just white. white. There's not one yeah. blue line uh -huh. that you can see. And I'm like, oh my God. And I try to speed check and I can't feel, I can't feel the tension. And all of a sudden I catch my toe edge speed oh, checking. Yeah. I'm on my heels. And this is a, this is a wipeout that is on YouTube. That is pretty, pretty violent. Epic. And how my back heel edge hits the back of my head like the, the mobility i have but how violently i whip around and how you know i knock myself out i crack my goggles i'm i i don't know where up from down is and people are coming to assist me and now you just start to see the other yeah, girls start right. to come down it wasn't like they were right there and they passed and you know it was it was a lights out moment and I'm trying to tell him like, don't unstrap me. You'll DQ me. Like, <laughs> like you still have the competitor yeah, mindset, right. in you, but they're like, you are not there. You are not coherent. You need to stop. Cause I still try to make myself go. And yeah, that, that was a very, very violent one. It was sun Valley crash. Oh, it was brutal. And then one of my other crashes was in Val Milenko, Italy and me being someone that wants to improve my speed we had two time trial runs and you know i put down a pretty decent one but i was like i can do these rollers faster yeah so i remember starting out of the gate and going over you know one or two of the first features and i vividly remember one of my earlier coaches he's not he wasn't my coach at the time standing on the side videoing because he's in like a bright suit so I can see him right away you're pretty aware of like what's happening around but you're not fully focused on uh -huh. it you're still like it's not the task but it picks up in your peripheral so those moments where I pick up those people I'm like huh okay I know where that person is um and I'm coming through the middle part of the course and it's these rollers and they're really deep rollers and these rollers have already claimed some people, but uh -huh. I've always felt confident that I'm the best at rollers. I can get my body moving quickly. I have incredible range. I should be fine. And 
I just wake up <laughs> in a helicopter. I, I wake up getting loaded into a helicopter and Ross, the guy that I had previously seen is like the first person responding to yeah. me. And I'm like, how did you get down here so fast? He's like, you've been knocked out for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh shit. So I don't know what fully happened. And I must've caught an edge in that roller section and you do that, your upper body trajectory just keeps going. Yep. So you're the next thing to hit, hit the next feature. So I would say that was probably my next brutal encounter. And then when you're in the hospital in a country that you can't speak uh -huh. the language and apparently I'm like speaking Spanish, <laughs> I don't <laughs> speak Spanish very well. I did, I did better back, back then but they're taking off all my jewelry mm -hmm. and they're shoving it into my underwear and cutting everything else off of me. And so I'm not remembering that. So later when I get out of the hospital, I'm like, why is there a bag of jewelry in my underwear? Yeah. <laughs> it was just so weird trying to understand what was going on and how they handle things differently. Well, I totally feel self-conscious now because I was going to tell you about snowboarding down the side of a mountain in Colorado and I fell down and I had a tin of Altoids in my back pocket, not the smartest place to place them when I landed directly on them, but that's not nearly as cool as your wipeout stories. So <laughs> let's just stay with yours. You, you would be surprised people having things in their pocket and breaking ribs. Yep. And it's not, it's not uncommon and it's not something you would think. You just naturally think like, okay, I'm putting my Altoids back in my pocket. Yeah. It makes sense. But you know, we have that with our cell phones now and right. like you strategically now try to place your things where you're like, I'm not going to crack a rib if I fall or I won't be falling yeah. in this way. You can't always plan that. So don't be too hard on yourself. I got a couple of pretty epic wipeouts when I landed with a parachute, but we'll let those, we'll save those for another day. Um, hey. let's get to the 2022 games. Um, you really did blow me away. And I don't mean this, uh, this language lightly. You're a legend in the sport because you have been so successful for so long. So now it's 2022. You and Nick are about to compete against competitors that are literally half your age. You're 36 years old and you are going against ladies that are, uh, you know, have been, uh, half you, you've been in the, the sport for what? 18? Longer than they've been yeah. living. Longer, yes. longer than they're alive now. Um, and this is the moment that I described just a few mon uh, a few seconds ago in this broadcast where I'm watching this and I'm watching you two and I'm just saying, look at her and Nick show up all of these younger athletes. And what really impressed me is how you two just let it all go and let it all hang out. And not only did you, uh, not only did you compete well and represent the U.S. well, but you came away with the gold. So can you describe that uh, the, the, the last uh, few weeks or the last couple of seconds of the Winter Olympics just a few months ago? Days earlier, I just won the single event. So I was on cloud nine and I was so happy and I was almost having this feeling like it doesn't matter what I'm happens I'm the top today. of the world, yeah. So yeah, I was just like, you know, it's fine. Like, we're going to race again. It's not that big of a deal. And then I get up there and I'm like, wait a minute. Nick's going to want a medal. Yeah, he's going to want to go away with a goal. I game again. Yeah. I, I was like, I need to start treating is that this for real. Like, this, this is, you know, he did not have the luck in his single event. You know, he got yeah. taken out. He was super upset about that. Like, understandably so. That it's happened to all of us. And... It can be, SBX can yeah. be such a cruel mistress in that yeah. way. And, you know, it just happened that it finally came together for me after all of these years, after five Olympics, yeah. after more than 15 years, it's just, it finally happened. So who knows if that calmness just helped continue that energy, um, you know, I, I don't really know, but I went immediately into the mindset mode once I got up there to be like, okay, we attack this how we always do. Uh -huh. Same thing. We've got training. We're assessing, you know, new snow conditions. We are communicating with coaches. We are talking to our wax techs, um, you know, working with our PTs, doing our same warmups. Nothing's changed. Um, the difference between the team event, it makes it more fun because yeah. – you are not so much as an, in an individual sport anymore. And we're actually training and working together with 
Faye and Jake Vetter, which mm-hmm. it was his first Olympics as well. So all four of us are in the gate training together. We pull out at the same time. Obviously, the boys are going to be closer uh-huh. and they're kind of racing. But then Faye and I are going to be racing and we are going to try a couple different lines, a couple different tactics. Mm-hmm. And we had planned this up at the top. You're like, I'm going to try this double. You keep it on the ground or vice versa. I'm going to take this line in the bank, see if we're gaining or losing any ground so we can make the best judgment as a team. So then once we go up and we are in the relay moment, we're going to have an advantage. So there's so much strategy that comes into play that so many people don't really consider, but it's, it's something that I've just learned over decades in this sport. Yeah. And, you know, my X games experience definitely played, you know, suit into this and same with bomb, just having that gliding. He's a bigger guy. He was able to just keep yeah. the speed keep calm and not panic when you're in traffic. And that's, that's huge. And that takes so much time and experience because it's easy to panic. You have no control of what these other people are going to do. You're essentially giving them trust, blind trust yeah. that they're not going to do something crazy. And that's, that's rolling the dice. That's just, that's just a huge risk. Yeah. Well, just watching you those last few seconds on your run and watching you come across the line, knowing that you guys just won the gold, that was just spectacular. And I hope the rest of America was jumping up and down like I was when I was watching that event. I mean, bomb had also had time to recover, yeah. even though he was cheering very enthusiastically, but I come down and I can barely unstrap myself. My legs are like j- yeah. jiggling. They're just like so tired. And then he's hugging me in this like chokehold. I'm like, get off of me. Yeah. I can't, I can't breathe. breathe. Yeah. I appreciate the love, but right. observe our distance, please. Yeah. yeah. But it was, it was just so great to be able to give him that moment yeah. and, it's, it's been, uh, you know, a really special, you know, part of our relationship of how we've known each other for so long and to where we gave us, you know, a a pretty sweet ending for that uh, Olympic cycle for sure. Yeah. Well, as we wrap this broadcast up, look, you have been competing at the highest levels for decades. You have been the woman that a lot of girls have grown up looking up to but you've also been down and you've been banged up and, um, and faced some pretty severe injuries. And I'd like for you to just give our listeners a piece of advice. So this whole podcast exists just to help people when life has knocked them down and they're looking around and saying, I don't know if I have what it takes to get up and to dust myself off and go back down the the run again. So Lindsay, what would you say to somebody who just got knocked down by life and they're sitting there and they're saying, I don't know if I have what it takes. It's not much different than the symmetry of having injuries or, you know, personal setbacks in your life is not much different than anyone going through their normal life, Um, whether they're dealing with, you know, illnesses or, or, or family traumas, you know, these are moments that you can grow from and learn from and find your support system. And I'm actually writing a book right now because of my, you know, ups and downs, it's been an incredible journey. And then, you know, really looking back on all of my ups and downs really helps shape you as a person, but it also gives you an opportunity to grow as a person and, you know, falling in the 2006 Olympics, you know, if it completely had gone differently and I won during that time, would I be even close to the same person that I am today and the knowledge and the amount of time and support that I've put into this community. So falling is a part of life. Getting beat down is a part of life. It sucks. It's not great, but, you know, find your support systems that you have and, you know, find that inner strength that you have and, you know, sharing more of my stories in my book of what I was going through every Olympic cycle, which not only my personal setbacks from, 2006 but other things that were yeah. happening in my life you you might just be like oh you know she's dealing with other yeah. things it's yeah. not you know so many times athletes are painted as these like perfect beings right. that all they exist in this in this world and why can't they perform in that time like they never they never are forgiving right. it's like 
maybe they're dealing with something yeah. else maybe right. <laughs> and and you know even coming back and bringing some of those memories up and i'm like huh i didn't realize how that could have probably right. played a huge impact in 2014 mm -hmm. you know olympics or then the 2018 olympics it's just been this slow steady climb but the 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 mental fortitude and and not giving up that's that's you deciding to not give up on yourself and that's ultimately you know my push for you know my message in my book and that you're you're worth not giving up on yeah. yourself how close is the book to being finished when can people expect it um i need to get the manuscript in january of next uh -huh. year so then you know it's it's coming together uh really well and um I'm not really sure on how that industry works because I've yeah. been a snowboard. I have not been in the publishing world, even though I did my first children's book. I All mean, right. I didn't know, look at you. I didn't know what I was yeah. doing. It was kind of just this COVID little pet project mm -hmm. that I had this idea from the 2014 Olympics. And I just decided, I was like, well, I'm stuck inside. Maybe I'll just do some research to figure out how do I get a kid's book published. Right. And I pitched it to a bunch of, publishers and they weren't into it that like, we got our ki kids books and people like just self-publish I was like oh you can do that so I did that and then I put it on Amazon because right. why not have it on yeah. Amazon everything's on yeah, Amazon right. so that was the goal I was like I'm gonna get a book and put it on Amazon all right <laughs> so I want to be able to search it and find it so it you know it was just I I know nothing of this world and I had so many trials and yeah. errors and you know it's not much different than than life sure. it's just trying to figure out and navigate and find what works for yeah. you so um i'm hoping by the fall of uh 23 that this book will be available okay. for viewers well there you go everybody mid to late uh 2023 be on the lookout for lindsey jacob ellis's new book hey thank you so much for giving me some time some time i know your schedule has been insane since the olympic games and i appreciate you carving out a little bit of time to do this episode of unbeatable with me no worries. I'm finally happy that uh, we got got this together and we were able to link up. All right. We'll see you around. All righty. Lindsay's gone through some hard knocks. She's gone through some serious injuries. And I'm sure you can relate to some of her stories because maybe life has knocked you down. Her final piece of advice to us on this episode of Unbeatable is don't give up. But I want you to pay close attention to the way she said this. Don't give up on you. So if you've been knocked down and beat up by life just a little bit lately, get back up, dust yourself off. Don't get up, give up on you and be unbeatable too. Hey, thanks for joining us. If this is your first time connecting with us, why don't you go ahead and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform? And if you've been with us for a while, why don't you follow us on social media? Just search for at Unbeatable Podcast. Hey, if there's anything that we can do for you to help you get connected to other people that are going through something similar, why don't you join the Unbeatable Army? It's guys and gals that are connected with each other because of this podcast. And all you got to do to become part of the Unbeatable Army is go to unbeatablearmy.com. Thanks for joining me. See you next week.